In the last section, we finished up our single container deployment over to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. Before we move on, quick reminder, please do not forget to terminate the application that we just put together. I put directions for terminating the app in the last section, kind of a quick text section that shows you very quickly how to terminate the application. You need to terminate that thing so that you do not get billed money. If you're okay with paying a couple bucks, then you can certainly leave the application running. But if you don't want to be billed any money, then please make sure that you terminate the application. All right, so we finished up the application or the entire deployment successfully, but there was a couple of big ticket items in there that I think were kind of big issues, things that we did not quite do as well as we could have. So here are some of the issues that I think we ran into with that single container deployment process. First off, the entire application was very simple. It was a single React application backed up by an Nginx server. Not a real a lot of complexity there. We weren't relying upon any outside services or databases or anything like that. And so I think that if we are going to really get mastery of containers and deployment and all that kind of stuff, we might need to work on an application that is a little bit more complex and maybe has kind of an intermix of a couple of different services. The other thing that I want to point out is that we were building our image multiple times. We built out our image over on Travis CI when we ran our tests, and we also built the image a second time after we pushed all of our code through Travis over to Amazon Elastic Beanstalk. And I'm going to suggest that maybe that wasn't the best approach because we were essentially taking our web server or the web application and we were using it to build our image. Chances are we really want our web server to be just concerned with running our web server. And we probably don't want to have it to have to do this extra process of building out our image. So I think that maybe that was kind of a bad approach to allow our Docker image to be built multiple times and most especially allow it to be built on our active running web server. The third item, and this is very closely related to the first one we just spoke about, we had a very simple, very straightforward application. It did not make use of any outside services. So there was no database that we made use of, no API, no Redis server for caching or anything like that. So I think that if we really want to get some mastery of Docker and really understand how this stuff works, we probably need to work on a little bit more complicated application. And that's exactly what we're going to start doing in this section. We're going to figure out how to build a multi-container application that makes use of multiple different databases or sources of information, tie it all together with Docker and Docker Compose, and then eventually deploy it off to Amazon Beanstalk as a multi-container application. So let's take a quick pause right here. We're going to continue in the next section, and we're going to talk about the specifics of the application that we're going to put together. So I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about some big issues that kind of came up as we were going through a single container deployment. In this section, we're going to start talking about the application that we're going to make to give you more experience on building a multi-container application. So one application that uses many different containers or many different services to achieve whatever its goal is. Now, to show you what we're going to build, I want to first give you a very quick overview on a side topic. So this right here is a diagram of the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is a sort of computer science topic. You'll see this very commonly come up in computer science or programming interviews. The Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers. So the sequence goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and so on. So it continues on much further than this. Any value or any index inside the Fibonacci sequence can be calculated by taking the previous two values and adding them together. So for example, to calculate this value right here, we would look at the previous two values of 1 and 2. If you add together 1 and 2, that gives you 3. And so that gives us the next value in the sequence. Then to calculate the next value, we would do 2 plus 3, add those together, and you get 5. The next value would be 3 plus 5, that gives you 8. 5 plus 8 gives you 13, 8 plus 13 gives you 21, and so on. In a computer science or a programming interview, a very common question that you might get is, write a function that calculates the Fibonacci value at a particular index. So for example, if I asked you to give me the index, or the, excuse me, the value of the Fibonacci sequence at index 7, you would have to calculate the number 21. And if I asked you to give me the value at index 5, you would need to calculate 8, and so on. 
So the application that you and I are going to be making is essentially going to be a fancy Fibonacci sequence calculator. And we're going to build this in a just absolutely over the top complicated fashion. You could absolutely build a function like just three or four lines of code that will calculate any number in the Fibonacci sequence. But again, to give you an example of a multi-container deployment, we're going to make a crazy, crazy over the top, way over complicated version of a Fibonacci calculator, just to give you more experience with a multi-container deployment. All right, so let's take a look at the mock-up for our application. All right, so here's the app right here. We're going to present the user with a little form at the top that's going to ask them what index they want us to calculate. So for example, a user might enter in right here, seven, and then they would click on submit. When the user clicks on submit, we're going to take that index and then we're going to have some backend processes or some servers that's going to calculate the Fibonacci value at index seven. And so eventually our application for index seven would need to calculate out the value 21. After the user submits that number right there, we would add the number seven onto this list of indices that our application has seen. So I would expect to see seven added on there. And then we should eventually also calculate the appropriate value for index seven. And so eventually I should see some line entry here of for index seven, I calculated 21, like so. All right, so that's the application, essentially a fancy Fibonacci calculator. And again, we're gonna make this just over the top complicated, way more complicated than it needs to be to give you a good example of a multi-container deployment. Now, the reason that we're doing a Fibonacci calculator here, as opposed to like a blog or like a Twitter application or something like that, is that I didn't want you to have to focus on the actual application implementation details. I didn't want you to have to worry about learning JavaScript or learning authentication or any of that stuff. And I just wanted you to be able to focus 100% on the Docker and deployment side of things. And so that's why we are using a rather kind of simplistic topic here as a subject of our application. Now, let's take a quick pause right here. Now that we've got a better idea of the application that we're gonna make, we'll come back to the next section and we'll start talking about the overall architecture of this application. So another quick break and I'll see you in just a moment. In the last section, we started talking about the application that we're going to build to learn more about multi-container deployments. In this section, we'll continue by talking about the backend architecture that we're going to use to implement this application. All right, so here we go. Here's the backend. Now, like I said, this is just over the top complicated, way more complicated than it needs to be by like a factor of 20. But I'm showing you this much more complicated backend just to give you an idea of how we can take these multiple containers or multiple components and fit them together into one application. Now this right here is a diagram of the development flow or the development architecture of our application. And so when we eventually push this into a production deployment, some of these pieces in here are going to change just a little bit, but I'll be sure to tell you exactly about exactly how they are going to change. So when a user boots up their browser and tries to visit our application, they're gonna first visit an Nginx web server, very similar to the one we had previously. The Nginx server is going to essentially do some routing. The server is going to decide whether the browser is trying to access a React application to get some front end assets, like the HTML file or some JavaScript file that will be used to build this application. If the browser is trying to access some front end assets like an HTML file or a JavaScript file, it will automatically route the incoming request to a running React server. If the incoming request is instead trying to access some backend API that we are going to use for submitting numbers and reading numbers and retrieving values, all that kind of good stuff, then the Nginx server right here will instead route the request to a Express server. So this Express server right here is gonna function as our API that's gonna serve up information or calculated values up to the front end application. Now, let me show you a couple more diagrams that's going to better explain this process right here. Okay, so you might've noticed that on the last diagram, we had these worker, Redis, and Postgres things over here. Remember that Redis is an in-memory data store and it's very commonly used for housing temporary or kind of cached values of sorts. I've also got Postgres right here, which is a database very similar to, say, MySQL. 
So you might have noticed that in our web application mockup, we had kind of these two sets of values right here. We had first values that the application has seen, or essentially values that have been submitted to the application. All of the information for this values I have seen is going to be stored in a Postgres database. And so you can kind of imagine that values I have seen right here, or really indices I have seen, is a very permanent stored set of data, all coming from Postgres. On the other hand, the calculated values that are going to be displayed right here, all this information is going to be displayed in a separate Redis database instead. And so again, we're just making this over the top complicated, way more complicated than it has to be. We have essentially identical data on the screen right here, but we're just going to arbitrarily say that, oh yeah, this source of data is coming from Postgres, this source of data is coming from Redis over here. Again, we're just doing that to make this a little bit more complicated and show you how you would work with these different sources of data in a single application. Now let me show you a flow of how our application is really going to behave behind the scenes. So let's imagine that a user submits a number to the React application. Like let's say they put a number into the form right here and then click the submit button. So when a user clicks on that submit button, the React app is going to make a API request or excuse me, an Ajax request to the backend Express server. The Express server, when it receives this number that it needs to calculate a Fibonacci number for, it's gonna first take that number and store it inside of our Postgres database. Because remember, that's gonna have a permanent list of all the indices that have ever been submitted to our application. At the same time, the Express server is also gonna take that index and put it into the Redis database as well. When a new number shows up inside of our Redis database, it's gonna wake up a separate backend Node.js process that we're going to refer to as the worker. The only job of this worker right here is to watch Redis for new indices that show up. Anytime a new index shows up inside of Redis, the worker is going to pull that value out it will calculate the appropriate Fibonacci value for it. It'll take that calculated value and then put it back into Redis so that it can then be requested by the React application and eventually show up on the screen. So again, over the top complicated, I can't say it enough. I don't think you would end up building a Redis, or excuse me, a Fibonacci calculator application with this type of flow right here, this type of architecture. But again, I just wanted to show you a multi-container deployment. So now that we've got a better idea of how all this works, let's take a quick pause. We're gonna come back to the next section and we'll start putting this application together from scratch. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we started talking about the overall architecture of the app that we're going to put together. Again, can't say it enough, way more complicated than it needs to be just so we have multiple containers to work with. So in this section, we're gonna start putting together the source code for the entire application. A quick note here, in this section and the next couple of videos, we're going to put, be putting together the JavaScript side of the application. We're not gonna to touch any Docker stuff for right now. So no Docker files, no Docker Compose, no Travis, no deployment, nothing like that. The reason that we're gonna focus just on the JavaScript side for right now is that if you do not care about all this JavaScript stuff, like you don't care about React, you don't care about Express, you don't care about any of that stuff, totally fine. You can skip this video and the next couple, you can move on to the next section. And in that section, I'm gonna post all the code that we're gonna write right now up for download. So if you don't care about JavaScript stuff at all, totally fine, pause the video here and skip ahead a couple of videos. I wanna make sure that if you are not a JavaScript person, you don't have to sit through all this stuff. Now I'm only showing how to put the application together from scratch in case you are a JavaScript person, person and you're kind of curious about how to work with Redis and set up this kind of like worker over here and Postgres and Redis and all that kind of other good stuff. So again, if you don't care about the JavaScript stuff, pause here, skip forward a couple of videos. Otherwise, we're going to get started right now. Okay, so the first thing we're going to put together is this worker process. Remember, the worker process is going to watch Redis for any new indices that get inserted. Anytime the worker sees a new index added to Redis, it's gonna pull that index and then calculate the appropriate Fibonacci value for it. Now, as we put this worker together, I'm not gonna tell you too much about the behind the scenes stuff, like specifically how we work with Redis from JavaScript code, because that's not really the goal of this course. But I will give you just a little bit of commentary to make sure you have the general idea of what's going on. So let's get to it. I'm gonna first begin by changing on over to my terminal. 
you'll notice that I'm back in a workspace directory of sorts, so I'm no longer inside of any of the folders that we've been working on so far. I'm going to make a new folder inside of here called complex. And the idea behind this is that the name of our application will be kind of like a more complex application. I'm then going to change into that folder. And then inside of here, I'm going to make another folder that's going to house all of the source code for this kind of worker process that's going to calculate the actual Fibonacci values. So I'll make a new folder inside of here called worker. And then finally, I'm going to start up my code editor inside of the complex directory. All right. So here's the worker folder that we just created. I'm going to first begin by adding a package.json file to it. So inside the worker directory, I'll make a package.json file. Then inside of here, we'll put down a little bit of configuration. We're going to add in a couple of dependencies that we're going to need. The first dependency that I'm going to want is nodemon which is going to give us some live reload of code anytime that we change the source of our project. We'll go more into that a little bit later. The version of Nodemon that I'm going to get is 1.18.3. I'm also going to get a Redis client that will allow us to connect to a copy of Redis and pull values out of it and do all the stuff that we need to do with Redis. And for that, I'm going to get version 2.8.0, like so. Now at this point, please make sure that you're keeping track of the code that I'm typing and the code you're typing. Please double check for typos and whatnot because we're not going to run any of this code for several sections. So if you make a typo in here, it's going to be kind of challenging to come back later on and find where you made that typo. So for example, make sure you get the comma at the end of the nodemon line. Make sure you do not have a comma at the end of the Redis line and so on. So now we're going to also put a script section in here as well. I'm going to add a comma at the end of dependencies, and I'll put in scripts, and then we're going to add on a start script of node index.js, and I'll do a dev script of simply nodemon, like so. All right, so that's it for our package.json file. Again, please double check the placement of your commas. Please make sure that you're using double quotes everywhere inside of here, and both all the keys and all the values should have double quotes around them as well. So that's all we need for package.json. I'm now going to create a separate file inside of here called index.js. So this is where we're going to put all of our primary logic for connecting to Redis, watching for values, and then eventually calculating our Fibonacci value. All the configuration or kind of keys that we're going to need for connecting over to Redis are going to be stored inside of a separate file. So the first thing I'm going to do inside of here is require in a file that we're going to call keys. And again, this file is going to house the host name and the port required for connecting over to Redis. So inside of the worker folder, I'm going to make another file called keys.js. And inside of here, we're going to add in a module.exports that's going to be an object that's going to have a Redis host of process.env Redis host and a Redis port of process.env Redis port. So anytime that we want to connect to Redis, we're going to look for the host name or essentially URL of sorts for Redis and the port that we're supposed to connect to it from, from our environment variables. So when we run this application, we darn sure better well have a Redis host environment variable and a Redis port environment variable defined as well. So that's all we have to put inside the keys file. I'm going to go back over to index.js. And then inside of here, now that we've got our API keys, or essentially just connection keys, I should call it, put together, we're going to start putting together the logic to get a connection over to our Redis server. So I'm going to first import a Redis client. We'll then create a Redis client. And to this thing, we're going to pass an object that has a host of keys.redis host, a port of keys.redis port. And we're going to add on one other little option in here called retry underscore strategy. And this is going to tell 
the Redis client that we're using right here, that if it ever loses connection to our Redis server, it should attempt to automatically reconnect to the server once every one second or once every 1000 milliseconds. After that, we're going to make a duplicate of the Redis client that we just put together. We'll talk about why we're doing that in just a moment. So I'll say const sub is Redis client dot duplicate like so. All right. After that, we'll then put together the function that's going to be actually used for calculating these Fibonacci values given some particular index. So the work function, we'll say function fib will be called with some index. We're going to say if index is ever less than two, then we're going to return the value one. Otherwise, we're going to return fib index minus one plus fib index minus two. This right here is a very classic solution to the Fibonacci sequence. It's going to return the value one if the index submitted is ever less than two. Otherwise, it's going to take the previous two values, add them together, and then return that. Now we could talk for days about exactly how this solution right here works. If you want to, you could always go look at a blog post or two to get a better idea about the Fibonacci recursive solution. Now we're very purposefully using a recursive solution right here because it's very slow and it's going to give us kind of a better reason for making use of Redis and having a separate worker process to calculate these Fibonacci values. So this is not an ideal solution right here, but it's one that kind of simulates why we would want to have a separate worker process. Now the last thing that we need to do inside of here, we're going to use the Redis client connection that we just put together. We're going to watch Redis for any time we get a new value inserted into it. And anytime we see a new value, we're going to run our fib function that we just put together. We'll say, oops, we'll say sub, which remember is the duplicate client right here. Sub stands for subscription because we're going to watch Redis and get a message anytime that a new value shows up. We'll say sub dot on message. So anytime that we get a new message, run this callback function that we're gonna add right here. The callback function will be called with something called a channel and a message. We'll then say redis client dot h set values message. And then finally, we're gonna calculate the actual Fibonacci value by saying fib parse int and message like so. And let me zoom out so you can see that whole line. So anytime that we get a new value that shows up in Redis, we're going to calculate a new Fibonacci value and then insert that into a hash of values or a hash called values. The key will be the index that we receive. So message right here is going to be the index value that was submitted into our form. And then we push in the value for Fibonacci sequence that we just calculated as well. And then the last thing that we're going to do inside this file, we'll say sub.subscribe to any insert event. So anytime someone inserts a new value into Redis, we're going to get that value and attempt to calculate the Fibonacci value for it, and then toss that value back into the Redis instance. All right, so like I said, we're going very light on detail right now because this is super off topic related to or compared to the actual Docker stuff that we're trying to talk about. The very last thing I want to do is I want to try to run this index.js file. The file is not going to run successfully, but it should at least tell us whether or not you have a typo in here. So back at my terminal, I'm going to change into that worker directory. And then inside of here, I'm going to execute node index.js. Now, if you see a message right here that says cannot find module Redis, that's good. That's what we want to see. If you made a typo somewhere in here, like let's say I have an extra colon or three on this line right here, and then I try to run node index.js, I'll see a different message. I'll see something that says, hey, you made a typo. So if you see anything other than cannot find module Redis, that means that you made a typo somewhere and you need to double check and find that typo in your code and fix it. All right, so that's it for the worker process. Let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last section, we put together all the source code that we're going to need for right now for the worker project. Again, the worker is what's going to watch Redis. Anytime that we get a new index inserted into Redis, the worker will automatically pull the value out and calculate the appropriate Fibonacci value for it, and then insert that value back into Redis. 
we're now going to start putting together the code for the Express server. As a quick reminder, if you don't want to go through any of this JavaScript specific setup, you can always move on to the next section and you'll find all the source code that we're writing inside that section. So all you have to do is download the file there and unzip it into your project. I'm only walking you through all the source code right now in case you're kind of curious about how to write a JavaScript application that makes use of all these different pieces. So let's get started on the Express server that's going to serve as the sort of API layer that communicates with Redis and Postgres and communicates information over to a running React application. So back inside of my code editor, we were just working inside that worker directory. I'm now going to make a second directory that I'm going to call server. And this thing is going to house all the code for our server, the Express server, that's going to function as the API. Now, quick note here, please make sure that you make the server directory next to or as a sibling to the worker folder. You do not want to place the folder inside of the worker process. Don't want that. So it needs to be outside in a separate sibling folder. Now inside of here, we'll get started by making a package.json file. We're going to have a couple of different dependencies and a couple of different scripts as well. So we'll first lift off or list off, excuse me, the different dependencies that our project is going to have. So for dependencies, we're going to get express at version 4.16.3. We're going to get a Postgres client at 7.4.3. We're going to get a Redis client at 2.8.0. We'll get a cores installation at 2.8.4. And then we'll get NodeMon as well for development purposes at 1.18.3, like so. And again, we'll talk about why we are no installing NodeMon as we start to put together the Docker side of this project. Now, next to the dependencies, I'm going to also define a script section Very similar to the worker process, we're going to have a development script or a dev script that runs NodeMon. And then we will also have a start script for node index.js. All right, as usual, please double check, make sure that you've got your commas after each one of these lines and make sure you've got double quotes everywhere inside of here. Need double quotes everywhere. So once we've got the package.json file all put together, I'll delete this excuse me, close the file, not delete it, my mistake. And then inside the server directory, we're gonna make another file called keys.js. And just like before, this file is going to house some of the different variables that we're going to need to connect to the running instance of Redis and the running instance of Postgres that will be associated with our application. So inside of the keys.js file, I'll say module.exports, and then inside of here, we're going to have a pretty good different number of pieces of configuration. So please, again, double check your typing in here because we're going to do a lot of typing. I'll first do a Redis host. That's going to come from the environment variable process.env.redis host. We'll get a Redis port. We will get a PG user. So this is the Postgres user that we're going to log in as from process.env.pg user. We'll do a PG host. We'll do a PG database. This is going to be the name of the database inside of Postgres that we're going to connect to. PG database. We'll get a PG password. As you might guess, this is the password to the database, which we're going to have to define at some point. So PG password. We'll get a PG port. Like so as well. So we should see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven entries inside of here. Now I gotta ask you at this point, again, please make sure that all of these environment variable names are capitalized. So you should see capital PG user capital PG host, capital PG database, and so on. And also double check all the keys on the left-hand side as well. If you make a typo inside this file, it's gonna be a little bit of a pain to track down in the future. So please just do a quick double check inside of here and make sure you've got the correct spelling for stuff like say, database on both sides and the correct spelling for password on both sides and so on. All right, so let's take a quick pause right here. We're gonna come back to the next se section and continue working on our server implementation. So I'll see you in just a moment. 
In the last section, we started putting together our server implementation by defining the package.json file and a couple of keys that are going to be used to connect to our running Redis instance and the running Postgres instance as well. I'll now continue by creating a new file inside of the server directory. I'm going to call this index.js. And this single file is going to house all the logic that we need to connect to Redis, connect to Postgres, and eventually kind of broker information between the two of them and the running React application. So we're going to do a lot of typing in here. Again, please make sure that you are paying close attention to all the spelling and all that kind of good stuff, because like I've said previously, it's going to be a little bit of a pain to trouble to shoot this stuff later on. All right, so let's get through this. At the very top of this file, we're going to first require in all the keys that we just defined inside the keys.js file. And then we're going to define a couple of different sections inside of here, because we're going to have several different things that are going on inside this file. The first section that we're going to make is going to be dedicated to express app setup. So this is where we're going to define and set up the express side of the application. So I'm going to first require in the express library. I'm going to also require in something called body parser. And we're also going to require in cores. I'll then make a new express application. And I'll tell the app to use cores and app.use body parser.json as well. Now notice that on both these lines right here, I say cores, and I've got a set of double parentheses and body parser.json, and then double parentheses there as well. Very quickly, let's talk about what's going on right here. We first require in the express library. We require in the body parser library and the cores library as well. We then create a new express application. So this app right here is essentially the object that's going to receive and respond to any HTTP requests that are coming or going back to the React server, or something the React application. We then wire up something called cores. Cores is short for cross-origin resource sharing. And it's essentially going to allow us to make requests from one domain that the React application is going to be running on to a completely different domain or different port, in this case, that the Express API is hosted on. The body parser library right here is going to parse incoming requests from the React application and turn the body of the post request into a JSON value that our Express API can then very easily work with. Now, very quickly, I think that we might have missed the dependency body parser inside of our package.json file. You know, I'm looking at this and I think that we did miss that. Let's add on that dependency here very quickly. So inside of the package.json file, I'm going to add on body-parser. And I'll just specify the version as star like so. And we'll just get the latest version of it. Okay, so quick change inside of the package.json file. Now back over inside of index.js, after doing the express app setup, We'll then do some setup to create and connect to our running Postgres server. So this will be a new section that we'll call Postgres Client Setup. So this is going to be all the logic required to get the Express application to communicate with the running Postgres server. Remember, Postgres is a SQL type database, very similar to, say, MySQL, MySQL. So right here, we're going to require in the pool module from the PG library. Notice that I've got the curly braces around pool right here. And then we're going to create a new PG client or Postgres client out of this pool object. So I'll say new pool. And to this thing, we're gonna pass in some of the different keys that we had defined inside of the keys.js file. And remember, we already required in that keys file at the very top. So we're gonna pass in user as keys.pg user, pass in host as keys.pg host, database as keys.pg database, password as keys.pg password, and port as keys.pg port. Now again, can't say it enough, please double check all the keys on the left-hand side and double check your spelling on pg user, host, database, password, and port. Then after all that, we're going to add on a little air listener down here. We're going to say pgclient.onair. 
Anytime that an error with the connection occurs, we'll console log out a little message that says lost PG connection. Like so. Okay, so that's it for doing the initial setup of the Postgres client. But unfortunately, we have to do one other quick piece here. Anytime that we connect to a SQL type database, we have to initially create at least one time a table that's going to store all of the values. So in our particular case, we're going to create a table that's going to store all of the values that have ever been, or all the indices to be precise, that have been submitted to our FIB calculator. Remember, that's the only job of Postgres here. Postgres is just going to store the indices of any submitted value. It's not going to actually store the calculated values or anything like that. It's just saying, hey, this index of 10, this index of 5, they have both been submitted. So we're going to create a table inside the database to house that information. Now, the syntax that we're going to use for that right here is going to be just a little bit complicated. We're going to say PG client dot query. And then inside of a string, we'll say create table if not exists. So this is going to create a table if it has not already been created. And we'll say values. And then in a set of parentheses, we'll say number int, like so. So the name of the table is going to be values. And it's going to store a single column of information that we'll refer to as number. And so number right here is essentially going to be the index of the submitted value from the React application. Now to this thing, I'm going to go into leave off the semicolon on the very end, and I'm going to add on a catch statement. So if anything goes wrong with creating that table, we'll console log an error so that we know, hey, we were not able to successfully make the table. All right, so that's it for the Postgres setup. We've got all the connection logic right here, and we've got a single line of code right here that's going to make sure that we've got a table inside that database that can hold the indices of all the submitted values that have been entered into the application. Let's do another quick break right now. When we come back to the next section, we're going to add on another little block of configuration down here that's going to make sure that we can connect to our Redis instance from the Express API. So another quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we added in some logic to the Express server that's going to get us a connection over to Postgres over here and create a new table inside the database if it doesn't already exist. We're now going to make sure that the Express server has a connection over to Redis. So anytime that a user submits a new number to the React application, the React app will push that index over to the Express server, and the Express server will then push that index into the running Redis instance. So back inside of my index.js file inside of the server directory, underneath all the Postgres stuff, I'll put on a new section that we'll call Redis client setup. So here we'll say const Redis is require Redis. And we're going to do some very similar create client calls that we did inside of the worker folder just a moment ago. We'll say const Redis client is Redis.create client. I'm going to pass this an object that's going to have a host coming from keys.redis host, a port from keys.redis port, and then finally we'll define a retry strategy. That's going to be an arrow function that always returns the number 1000 to say, if we ever lose connection to Redis, try to reconnect to it once every one second. One thing I want to point out here is that the key for retry strategy is separated by a underscore right there, as opposed to the JavaScript standard of camel case like so. So make sure that you've got underscore strategy and strategy should have a lowercase s. And then very similar to what we did before, where we created a duplicate connection, I'm going to also make a Redis publisher. I'm going to use a more descriptive name this time around than when we created that duplicate copy of the Redis client over inside of the worker index.js file, just because we have uh, many more variables inside of this server file. So I'll say const Redis publisher will be Redis client dot duplicate. Now, in case you're curious, we are making these duplicate connections in both files because according to the Redis documentation for this JavaScript library, if we ever have a client that's listening or publishing information on Redis, we have to make a duplicate connection 
because when a connection is turned into a connection that's going to listen or subscribe or publish information, it cannot be used for other purposes. So that's why we're doing this duplicate thing in both locations. All right, so that's pretty much it for the initial setup here. Now we're going to start to define some of the different routes that our server is going to eventually respond to. So down here, we'll put down another section and we'll say express route handlers. I'm going to first make a test route, something that we can use to make sure that our application is working the way we expect. I'll say app.git forward slash. This thing is going to be called with a request and response. Anytime someone makes a request to the root route of our express application, I'm going to send back a response of hi, like so. We'll then define another route handler at the route values slash all. This route handler is going to be used to query our running Postgres instance and retrieve all of the different values that have ever been submitted to Postgres. So this is essentially going to return all of the values that have ever been submitted to our application or all the indices that have been submitted. This is going to be an async arrow function. So don't forget the async keyword right there. We'll do request and response. And then inside of here, we're going to make a query to the Postgres instance by saying const values is await e.g. client.query. And the query we're going to issue is going to be a SQL query. We'll say select star from values. So essentially look at the values table that we created a little bit ago and pull all the information out of it. And then we're going to send all that information back to whoever is making request to this route. So I'll say res.send values.rows. The dot rows right here is going to make sure that we only send back the actual information that we retrieve from the database and no other information that is contained inside this values object. The other information that's in here is some information about the query itself, like say how long it took or what tables we touched or stuff like that. So we're just going to send back the relevant information to whoever made a request to this route handler. Next up, we're going to add another get request handler to values slash current. This is going to be another async function. So don't forget the async keyword. We'll do rec res. And inside of here, we're going to reach into Redis this time. So reach into Redis, and we're going to retrieve all of the different values, all the different indices and calculated values that have ever been submitted to our backend. So find all the value, or excuse me, all the indices that have been requested from our users and return all the accompanying values that have been calculated for each one. So inside of here, I'll look at Redis client h get all, which essentially means look at a hash value inside the Redis instance and just get all the information from it. The hash that we're going to look at is called values. We're going to pass in a callback function that has error and values. Inside this thing, we're just going to send back res.send values. Now, quick note here, you'll notice that up here we're making use of the await or async await syntax. And down here, we're doing a very classic callback for our asynchronous route data handling. Unfortunately, the Redis library for Node.js doesn't have out of the box promise support, which is why we have to use callbacks as opposed to making use of the nice async await syntax. Just a quick side note there. All right, so I know this is a long section, but we just need to do one more route handler down here. So let's just get that done with. So the last route handler that we're going to define is going to receive new values from the React application. So anytime that a user puts a new index in here, like say seven, and then clicks on submit, they're going to try to post that information to our backend. So from the React application to the Express server, that's the route handler that we're going to define right now, last route handler. So I'll say app.post, because this time we're going to be listening for a post request. And I want to watch for a post request to the values endpoint. We'll then put in an async callback, so rec res. And then inside of here, we're going to first get the index that the user just submitted from rec.body.value, excuse me, index. So look at the index that the user just submitted from rec.body.index. We're then going to make sure that the index that was submitted is less than 40. 
So if a user puts in a number that's or an index that's really high, calculating a Fibonacci number with a method that we've put together inside of our worker process for a very large index will take a very, very, very long time, like on the order of years or decades or centuries. So we're just going to arbitrarily cap the size of the index that the user submit to make sure that our worker process does not just get arbitrarily forever locked down for all time. So I'll say if int of index is greater than 40, then we're going to immediately return and send back a status of 422 and send the message value or index to high, like so. So now that we've got this index or the number that we're going to use to calculate a Fibonacci value, we're going to first take that value and we're going to put it into our Redis data store. So I'll say Redis client dot h set values. We'll put in the index and then as the value for that index, we're going to put in nothing yet. So eventually the worker is going to come to the hash or kind of data structure that we're creating inside of Redis. And it's going to replace this nothing yet string with the actual calculated value. So nothing yet essentially means we've not yet calculated a Fibonacci value for this particular index. After we put the value in there, we'll look at the Redis publisher and we'll publish a new insert event of that index. So this right here is going to be the message that gets sent over to that worker process. It's going to wake up the worker process and say, hey, it's time to pull a new value out of Redis and start calculating the Fibonacci value for it. And then after doing both those steps, we're also going to look at our Postgres client and we're going to add in the new index that was just submitted. So remember, the Postgres database is going to be storing this kind of permanent record right here. It's going to be storing the permanent record of all the different indices that have ever been submitted to our application. So we'll say pgclient.query insert into values we are inserting a value for the number column. So I'm gonna say number and then values dollar sign one, like so. I'll then put in a comma, an array, and I'll list out the index that was submitted to our application for that. So this line right here is gonna take the submitted index and permanently store it inside of Postgres. And then finally, as a response at the very end, I'll say res.send, and we'll just send back some arbitrary response like working true to say, all right, we are doing some work to calculate your Fibonacci value. So now as the very last step, inside of the index.js file, we're gonna set up app.listen, and we're gonna listen to port 5000 inside of here. And we'll set up a callback, and we'll just say something like console log, listening like so all right so i know that's a lot of typing but that's all we have to do for the index.js file inside of our express folder so again we're going to try executing this file at the command line now the file's not going to work as it stands right now because we do not have a running redis server or a running postgres server but it's going to at least allow you to determine whether or not you have a typo inside this file so I'm back inside of the complex directory, which we call as the root folder for our entire project. I'm going to change into the server directory. And then inside of here, I will run node index.js. Now you want to see a message of something like cannot find module express. If you see anything else, that means that you have a typo somewhere, either inside of the index.js file or inside of the keys.js file. So you'll want to look at both these files and try to find the typo. Now, if you can't find the typo, that's totally fine. Remember, I'm going to post all of the correct code that we're writing right now in like one or two or three more videos. So if you see an issue, don't sweat it. You don't have to stare at your code all day. You can always just open up my copy of this project and copy paste everything from my index.js file into your index.js file. Okay, so let's take a quick pause right here. In the next section, I think that we've got just like a tiny bit more. Actually, you know what? I think that might be it. Oh, we got to do the React application, of course. How could I forget? All right, so quick pause, come back in just a second, and we'll put the React app together. So I'll see you in just a bit.
in the last section, we finished putting together all the source code for the Express server. We're now gonna move on to the React app implementation. Now, quick reminder here, all the stuff we're doing right now is 100% optional. I'm just showing you this in case you are interested in JavaScript and want to understand the behind the scenes of how we communicate to Express and how Express communicates over to Redis and Postgres and all that kind of good stuff. So if you're tired of doing all this boatloads of typing without a lot of explanation around it, you can always skip this, move ahead a couple of videos to the next section where you can download all the source code for what we're doing right now. So in this section, we're going to start working on the React application. It's the last piece of the puzzle that we have to get to before we move back over to the Docker side of things. So to get started, I'm going to go back over to my terminal. In the last application we put together, we had installed Create React App. And so we're going to depend upon that in this section. So you might want to make sure that you still have a valid Create React App install. So at your terminal, run Create React App, and you should see a message like this right here appear. If you don't see this, you can always go back to the last section or the last application we worked on and take a look at the setup directions for Create React App. Now you'll notice that I'm back inside of the complex directory. I'm not inside of server anymore. So once you are back inside the complex directory at your terminal, we'll generate a new React application using Create React App. So I'll say Create React App, and then our project is going to be called simply Client. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to start downloading and generating a whole bunch of project files. So just like before, this entire process takes a couple minutes. So I'm going to take a quick pause right here and come back to the next section after everything has been successfully generated. So I will see you in just a minute. In the last section, we generated a brand new project using Create React App. We're now going to open up our code editor and find the newly generated client directory. So inside the SRC folder of the client directory, we're gonna start working on one or two new files that's going to represent the different screens that we're able to navigate to inside of our application. Now, when we previously looked at some of our mockups, we saw this kind of fib calculator that you see on the left-hand side over here. In reality, we're going to actually make two separate pages that a user can visit, both the fib calculator on the left-hand side, and then we're gonna have some other kind of dummy page on the right-hand side. The only reason that we are doing this other page over here, which we're going to literally call other page, is to show you an example of HTML5 push state routing. So if you don't have a background in React or React Router, don't worry about it too much. Essentially, I just wanna make sure that you have a very complete front end example that shows you how you can navigate to different nested pages in a single application while still using Docker. So to get started, we're going to first put together a very little bit of code to represent this other page over here. We'll then start to work on the fib calculator, this screen over here on the left-hand side. So for the screen on the right-hand side, I'm going to open up my code editor. I'll find the client SRC folder. And then inside there, I'm going to create a new file called otherpage.js. Inside of here, we'll import React from React. I will import link from React Router DOM, and then I will export default a functional component, like so. And then inside there, I'm gonna return just a tiny bit of JSX. So it's gonna have a div. The div will have some text like I'm some other page, and it will also have a link back to our main page. And we'll give it the text of go back home. Okay, so again, we're just doing this right here so I can give you a complete navigational example on the front end of our application. And if you're not coming from the world of React or React Router DOM or anything like that, don't sweat it. Essentially, it's just another page that we want to be able to navigate to. So now that we've got that all put together, we're gonna start working on the main page. So the actual Fibonacci calculator. So on this thing, we wanna have a form where a user can enter in some index and submit it and then see a list of all the indexes that have ever been submitted and see a list of all the different values that have been calculated. So for that, I'm gonna create another new file inside my SRC directory. And I'm going to call this one fib.js, like so. Then inside of here, we'll start off with a little import statement at the top. I will import react and component from react. I will import Axios from Axios, which is a module that we're going to use for making requests to that backend express server. 
And then we'll create a new class called fib, which is going to be extending the component base class. At the very top of this, we're going to initialize some default state. So I'll st say state equals an object, and it'll have a couple of different properties inside of it. I'll say scene indexes is an array, values is going to be an empty object, and index will be an empty string like so. Now we're going through this code pretty quickly. As a reminder, I'm just kind of giving you a very high level description of what's going on. This is all stuff that is super unrelated from the world of Docker. And if you don't care to learn any of this JavaScript stuff or you just don't care about it one bit, you can always continue on to that future section that has all this code for download. I'm just putting these videos in here in case you're kind of curious about the inner workings of the application. All right, so now the instant that this component is rendered on the screen, we're going to want to attempt to fetch some data from our backend API. So I will define a component did mount lifecycle method that will call two helper methods. One will be this.fetch values, and the other will be this.fetch indexes. And then I will define both those helper methods. So first off, fetch values. This is going to be an asynchronous method, so I will mark it with the async keyword because we're going to do a little bit of data fetching in here. So I will make a request to get a list of all the different values that have been stored on our API. I'll say await axios.git slash API slash values slash current, like so. And then I will set my state on this component by calling this.setState and passing in an object with values is values.data, like so. Then we'll also set up the fetch indexes. So this is the list of indexes that have been requested and stored inside of our Postgres server. It's kind of the hard-coded copy, just saying, hey, here's a list of all the indexes that have been ever submitted to the application. And so for that, we'll define another async method called fetch indexes. And this is going to look very similar to the helper function that we just put together. So I'll say const scene indexes. Again, this is a list of all the indexes we've ever seen. Will be await axios.git slash API slash values slash all. Oop, all without a V. And then we will again update our state by calling set state. And I'll pass in a key value pair of scene indexes is scene indexes dot data like so now i'm just going to double check to make sure that all my state lines up here yep i got scene indexes and values values and scene indexes all right so let's take a quick pause right here when we come back to the next section we're going to take this data that we are fetching from the back end api and attempt to render it on the screen after this component is rendered it's a quick break and i'll see you in just a minute in the last section, we created a new component called fib, and we added a couple of methods to it to set to fetch some data from our backend API. We're now gonna add on the ability for this thing to be rendered onto the screen of our browser and show some information to our user. So to get started, I'm gonna to go to the bottom of the fib class and define a render method. Inside of here, I'm gonna return a little bit of JSX. So I'll return a div. We know that we want to show a form to the user, like this form right here. So I'm going to make a form tab, excuse me, a form tag that has a label, a text input, and a button assigned to it. So I'll put in a form. I'll put in a label with some text like enter your index. I'll put in an input. And then finally, a button. And for the button, I'll give it some text like submit, like so. Now we do have to add in some event handlers to the form tag and the input tag, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. First, let's take care of the other two rendering pieces we need. So we need to make sure that we print out all the different indices that we've ever seen. And we also have to print out all the different values that have been, that have been calculated as well. So for each of those two little tables right there, I'm gonna place an H3 underneath the form tag. The first one will have a title of something like indexes I have seen. And then the second one, I'll give some text of something like, I don't know, 
about calculated values. Then underneath each of these, we're going to call a helper method that is going to render the table of all the indices that have been seen and all the different calculated values that have been calculated by the Redis worker. So for the first one, I'm going to make a helper method and I will place it inside of here with a set of curly braces like so. And I'll say this dot render scene indexes. So we need to define a helper method that will essentially just print out the list of all the indexes that our backend has ever seen. So I'll go and define that helper method called render scene indexes right now. Right above the render method, I'll add in render scene indexes. And then inside of here, we're going to look at the value of scene indexes that we fetched when we called fetch in indexes right here. So I will return this dot state dot scene indexes. Now scene indexes, just so you know, we haven't really looked at these data types that are floating around, but essentially this is an array as a variety of different objects in it. And each object has a number property. And that number property is the number that we want to print out on the screen. So I'm going to map over the list of all of those objects. And I'm going to put in a function right here. Notice how I've got the opening curly brace, or excuse me, the parentheses right here. I'm going to pull off just that number property that we care about by putting down a set of curly braces like so, and then adding in number to that. And then inside the arrow function, I'll put in number. So this statement that you see right here is going to iterate over every object in the scene indexes array and just pull out and return the number. So the result will be a list of numbers that we want to print on the screen. So to then make sure that they get printed out with a nice little comma in between each one, I'll add on a dot join. And to that, I'll give a comma and a space right after it like so. And so this is going to take all those numbers, all the numbers in that array, and join them together with a little comma and print them out very nicely on the screen. Okay, so that's it for render scene indexes. Now for calculated values, we'll do something very similar. Underneath calculated values h3, I'll place a set of curly braces, and we'll define a helper method called render values and call it with a set of parentheses. So this will be our helper method that will render out all the calculated values that we've ever worked with inside of our application. I'll again make a helper method right above the render method, and I will call this one render values, like so. Now in the case of scene indices or scene indexes, we were getting back an array of objects. That's the default return type when we were pulling data out of Postgres. And remember this list of data right here, all being handled by Postgres. Where's our diagram? Here we go. The calculated values table down here is all data that is stored inside of Redis. And we, when we pull data out of Redis, we're actually going to get back an object. And that's going to have a bunch of key value pairs inside of it. So to build out that little table of values, we're going to do just a little bit different iteration logic inside of here. I'm going to first make a new array called entries. We'll then iterate over all of the values that we have in the state values object. And then for every key inside there, where the key represents the index of the Fibonacci number, we're going to push a new entry into that entries array. So I'll say entries.push and then open a set up a set of parentheses here. I'll put in a div that's going to get a key property because we are building out a React list. And inside there, I'll say for index key, I calculated this dot state dot values at key, like so. And then at the bottom of render values, I will return that list of entries that we created. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Now the very last thing we have to do is set up some event handlers on both the input tag and the form to watch for any time that a user enters in some text and then presses the submit button. So I'll first start off with the input. I'm going to give myself a little bit of space here. I'll add on a value property to make this a controlled input. And the value property that we want to update here is going to be index. So back on the input tag, we'll do this.state.index. We'll do an onChange that's going to be called with an event. 
and we'll take that event and update our state. So index is event.target.value. I'm going to zoom out again just so you can see that entire line. Okay, now the very last thing we do, we need to watch for any time that a user submits the form. So on the form, I will add on a on submit event handler, and that will call a callback that will call, how about something like handle submit. So now we just have to watch for the handle submit event helper to be called. Let's make sure we define that helper method. I'm going to go above render scene indexes right here, and I'll define handle submit. Now we want handle submit to be a bound function. So I'm going to say handle submit equals an arrow function like so. This is going to be an async function because we are going to try to send some information to our backend API. So I'm going to mark it as async as well, like so. Then inside of here, we'll make sure that we keep the form from attempting to submit itself by calling event prevent default. And then we will make a Axios post request to API slash values. And we're going to send in an object that has a key of index, and the value will be whatever the user just typed into that input. So this.state.index. And then after successfully submitting this to the back end, I can then clear out the value of the input by calling this.setState. Index will be empty string. All right, so that's pretty much it. Again, I know we're going through this extremely quickly. I can't say it enough. I'm just showing you this in case you're a little bit curious about how this stuff is working behind the scenes. But we could just about got everything done on the React side. So let's take a quick pause right here, and we'll continue in the next section. Oops, one little thing we missed. In our class of fib right here, we completely forgot to export this component down at the bottom. So in fib.js, I'm going to go down to the bottom of this file. And outside of that closing curly brace for the class fib, I'll add in export default fib, like so. Oops, again, my mistake. I apologize for that. But we're good to go now. So let's take a quick break and continue in just a moment. In this section, we're going to wire up both the other page.js file and the fib.js file to our app.js component, which can be found inside the src directory. Because we're making use of two separate components here, and we want to have some navigation between the two, we're going to make use of the React Router DOM library. So before we forget, let's add that as a dependency to the client's package.json file. So inside of my client directory, I'll find package.json. I'll find the list of dependencies. And then inside of here, I'm going to add on the React Router DOM package at version 4.3.1. And we're also making use of the Axios library for making some requests. So I'll add on Axios here as well at version 018.0. And as usual, please double check and make sure that you get commas in all the appropriate locations. So comma 1, 2, 3, 4, and then no comma after Axios. I'll then save this file. And then we will open up the app.js file. So here's app.js. So essentially all we want to do is import in the two components we just made to this thing and then wire them up to React Router. Now that might sound like it's really complicated if you're not coming from the world of React, but trust me, it won't be that bad. The first thing we're going to do is add in a couple of import statements at the top of the file. So I'll say import browser router as router. I'll also import route and link, and that's all going to come from the React Router DOM library. I'll then import the two components that we just created. So other page from dot slash other page. And I'll import fib from dot slash fib. All right, now down inside of the render method of the app component, you'll notice that there's already a return statement inside of here. We're going to wrap all the markup that already exists right here with a new router component. So I'll put in the router tag like so. I'll close it off at the very bottom. And then I'm going to indent the div and everything inside of it. Next up, I'm going to find the p tag inside of here. I'm going to delete the entire paragraph tag. I'll replace it with a div. And this div is going to have two routes associated with it. I'll make a route 
with props exact and path equal to forward slash. And I'll define a component property of fib. And then the second route, we'll have a path of slash other page. And that will show the component, as you might guess, other page. And then finally, very last thing, inside the header after the image tag and the h1, I'll place a link tag to the root route. And I'll give it the text home. And then right next to it, I'll do another link tag to other page. And I'll give it the text other page, like so. So now, when our application first boots up, it's going to attempt to show the component associated with the root route. So that's going to be the fib calculator, essentially all the stuff that you see right here. Inside the header, we're also going to show links to go to the current page that we're already on. So essentially just like an identity route right here, but we'll also show a link to go to this other page component, which is associated with this route right here. Again, the only reason that we're doing this is so that if you're from the React.js world and you are familiar with React Router, you'll know how to kind of set up some basic routing with Nginx and make sure that it correctly works with HTML5 routing. And again, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later on. So that's pretty much it for this application. We have put together two components. We wired them up inside the app.js file. The fib component is going to attempt to fetch information from the Express API and show it on the screen. It also has the ability to eventually take some input from the user and post it up as a new index that needs to be calculated by the backend. Now, one last quick thing I want to check here. We might have made a little typo. Yeah, I think we made a little typo. Let's take a quick pause. We're going to come back to the next section and fix up one tiny little issue that I realized we just made. Totally my mistake. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute.